I'm happy to be talking to you today. Welcome to the cyberclism. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Cyber, 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 cyber. I'm afraid that uh, uh, the relationship between man and computer is uh, already past some of the ideas in science fiction. Um, Particularly now the web is around and you can spend a whole lifetime exploring that and getting lost. The internet, of course, is a communication network which is making the global family I've been talking about for decades. There's all sorts of different separate networks have been set up so the whole world will be wired up. Who would have dreamed that we could send useful quantities of light through bits of glass thousands of kilometers long? I think we're storing all our knowledge and all our art in computers now, so in a way the human race will become immortal even if humans die. A great deal of human history, art, Everything is on its way to the stars, and one day, of course, it will be picked up by whatever is out there. So, we already made our mark on the universe, uh, for good or evil. There must be a gigantic amount of information in, in, in the web, in the global network, but is there anything in that, net, in that network that understands that information? That's the question. I don't think there is at this stage. But I may be wrong, may be wrong, may be wrong, may be wrong. Arthur C. Clarke has long been hailed as a prophet of the future. He has lived most of his life here in Sri Lanka, surrounded by the Indian Ocean. But the isolation of this developing island country has not hindered Arthur Clarke from communicating with the rest of the world. In 1945, a 27-year-old Clark had a vision of the future. He sketched the idea of satellites which would orbit the Earth, transmitting radio signals around the globe. When the first satellites were launched, they entered into what scientists unanimously called the Clark Orbit. revolution for the last few decades. Uh, I mean, I, here in Sri Lanka, I'm particularly aware of this because I recall that in 1964, when a certain S. Kubrick tried to contact me, it took a couple of days to make the phone call. Well, now if I have a 10 second delay in my dialing, I get very annoyed. Stanley contacted me soon after Dr. Strangelove had been released and I said he wanted to do the proverbial good science fiction movie. And he wanted to make, and this was his actual phrase, a, something of mythic grandeur. He wanted a theme of mythic grandeur. And so we tried to develop the idea, and what is the most exciting thing? Well, man's place in the universe, what might it be? So that's why, that's the myth we tried to create, and I think we succeeded. Filmmaker Stanley Kubrick asked Clark to help him bring to the screen a story that was far ahead of its time. Kubrick was inspired by a novel that Clark had written called The Sentinel. 
The story was set in a futuristic time when humans were exploring the galaxy and using supercomputers which were able to think for themselves. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. We are all, by any practical definition of the words, foolproof and incapable of error. In 2001, a space odyssey inspired a society already pushing the boundaries of imagination. The film star, the HAL 9000 computer, encouraged and accelerated research into artificial intelligence. Was it possible to make a computer feel? Well, I don't know. That's a rather difficult question to answer. You don't mind talking about it, do you, Dave? No, not at all. All present computers are mechanical morons. They cannot really think. They can only do things for which they are programmed. But this will not always be true. In fact, um, probably before the end of this century, we will be able to construct computers or artificial intelligences which can go out on their own and develop lines of thought irrespective of any programming and which may in principle be more intelligent than we are there is no question about it i can feel it the great question is not whether a computer can think i think everybody almost everybody will now agree that computers can think in some sense of the word the question is can a computer be conscious can a computer feel and i think the answer to that will probably be yes in fact, um, I think Marvin Minsky, I believe, once said, um, uh, can a computer think? Of course you can. I'm a computer and I think. And that's a simple answer. If you like, I'm a computer, I feel. I can feel it. I'm afraid. Hal is not a computer of the vast distant future. It's just the next step. And uh, whether we'll reach that step in 10 years or uh, 500 years, we don't know. As Clark has pointed out, the technology of just 50 years ahead of uh, where we are at any time is likely to seem like magic. A film far ahead of its time inspired a race against time. I think uh, one of the things which uh, warmed us the most during this flight was the realization that however extraordinary computers may be, that we are still ahead of them and that man is still the most extraordinary computer of all. His judgment, his nerve, and uh, the lessons he can learn from experience still make him unique and therefore make man's flight necessary and not merely that uh, of uh, satellites. I think that the United States has committed itself to this great adventure in the 60s. I think before the end of the 60s, we will see a man on the moon, to the moon, an American. At the height of the Cold War, the United States wanted to beat the Russians to the moon. Scientists were conducting research to achieve this goal using supercomputers. However, these computers were isolated from each other. There was no way to communicate and exchange vital research data and information. A branch of the U.S. military was created, called the Advanced Research Projects Agency, codenamed ARPA. ARPA was ordered to develop the technology to link distant computers together. In 1968, they came to this man to make it happen. Leonard Kleinrock was a computer scientist at the University of California at Los Angeles. ARPA selected him to perform the most important communications experiment of the century. The military, the Department of Defense, is responsible for the Internet. It was a high-risk, high-payoff bet that they made and they won hugely big. 
I mean, basically driven this country forward. Kleinrock helped to develop a machine called an interface message processor, nicknamed the IMP. And in September 69, this very machine, the first piece of the internet ever, was delivered here at UCLA, and the network came to life at that point. And a month later, another one of these was delivered to Stanford Research Institute up at Stanford, California. And they connected their host to it. And so in October 69, the first message from a computer to a computer through two switches occurred. And that was the first message on the internet. The first link of a digital network was established. It was called the ARPANET. Within weeks, several other computer links were added to the ARPANET. The project had succeeded. Scientists could now share information between supercomputers. Leonard Kleinrock helped to ignite the digital revolution. 1969 saw man land on the moon, the summer of love, and the birth of the internet. You wonder, were we aware of the magnitude of this event? The answer is, no way. We didn't even have a camera. We had no idea that it would ever lead to anything like what we had now. Within a decade, the ARPANET grew beyond anyone's expectations. Universities, companies, and individuals linked their computers to the network. And then not only did the ARPANET grow, we began to connect other things to it. A satellite network, a ground radio packet network, and pretty soon, local area networks were being attached. We had an internet situation. That's where the word internet came from. ARPA could no longer control the fast-growing internet, which soon became self-governing. The 1980s brought about computers far smaller than their predecessors. With the availability of personal computers, the Internet inspired a worldwide digital conversation, an open marketplace of information and communication. The Internet functions through the transfer of data. Computers encode text, images, sound, and video into binary information, lengthy strings of ones and zeros known as bits. These bits travel from computer to computer by splitting themselves into a series of parts known as packets. Every second, millions of these packets navigate through the internet to reach their final destination. The millions of channels through which these packets move has become known as cyberspace. Today, 150 million people are connected to the internet. Well, look, there are 10,000 of them, you see. So that's the trouble. Now, how the hell, <laughs> how the hell do you find the one you want? Many are grateful to the man who helped to make the digital revolution a reality. I'm completely operational and all my circuits are functioning perfectly. And welcome to Cyberfest. And welcome to people watching and listening all over the world on the World Wide Web, including Mr. Arthur C. Clarke in Sri Lanka. In March 1997, cyber enthusiasts gathered in Urbana, Illinois, the town where Arthur Clarke imagined the HAL 9000 computer would have been built. I am a HAL 9000 computer. I became operational at the HAL plant in Urbana, Illinois. Clark didn't pick Urbana arbitrarily. It is the home of the University of Illinois, an institution that has always been at the forefront of computer science and research. Fans of 2001 and believers of artificial intelligence arrived in Urbana for the university's annual Cyberfest conference. And as far as we know, this is the only remaining piece of how uh, from the film. Word quickly spread on the internet that this was the official party for Hal's birthday. Event organizers wanted Clark to attend the Cyberfest. Though now 80 years old, Clark could not make the trip from Sri Lanka. It was suggested that he could appear in a live satellite transmission. 
though to uplink his image from Sri Lanka to Illinois would have been astronomically expensive. There was, however, another way for the grandfather of technology to attend Hal's birthday. I don't know if you noticed, it looks like the Ameritech nap. It's been kicking on and off for, for every, uh, they've been going down about a couple minutes at a time. John Sokol is a self-proclaimed internet guru. Uh, the internet's 26 years old. I've been on it for 15. Yeah, so I got 19 packets through and then nothing. It looks like what they call router flapping. We're talking about this multi-dimensional multi hyperspace that, that you can't even count dimensions anymore. It's not just four or five. It's like, you know, 5,000 dimension, you know. You, you remember that game Pick Up Sticks or whatever? You had the little sticks and the the tube and you'd pull sticks out and marbles would fall from unexpected places and this is kind of the, the internet. Sokol has been experimenting with a device called a live cam, a special camera that transmits a video signal over the internet. Before the Cyberfest, Sokol shipped a live cam to a cyber cafe in Colombo, Sri Lanka, down the road from Clark's home. The internet, of course, is a communication network which is making the global family I've been talking about for decades. And I hope that this wonderful facility will become universally available at the moment. It's true that only a few people in developed countries uh, you know, can afford this sort of thing, but more and more people in countries like Sri Lanka are getting it. Every village, I'm sure, will have a communication device of some kind in the, in the next few decades, so the whole world will be wired up. The plan was that Clark's video image would be transmitted to the Cyberfest via the Internet. This emerging technology has become known as cybercasting, and this would be the furthest video cybercast ever attempted, for Sri Lanka is exactly halfway around the globe from Illinois. We can see you. And your image is also going to go out on the World Wide Web all over the world, in addition to being on these three giant screens here. So. It's, everything so far has worked perfectly here as far as the technology is concerned. Just establishing, uh, you know, getting a video from Sri Lanka to here was, was uh, I think it's a first. I mean, I don't think anyone's ever attempted anything this difficult cybercast wise. Will the telephone, television, and internet all become one? Absolutely. Uh, I think that, that they're going to start converging. And we're pretty darn close to regular television. Um, you know, but for this event, by the time we get through the bandwidth coming out of Sri Lanka, we're down to about one frame uh, every second or maybe two frames every second. Yeah, I see it now. Hey, look at this. Very good looking. Very good looking. It takes about six seconds for internet packets carrying video from Sri Lanka to reach Illinois. Okay, if you could... Tell us as soon as you raise your hand and say now, and then hold up your hand in the air. Let's okay. but say now, and we're going to count the seconds. Okay, ready to go. Now. Wow. <laughs> the technology is a remarkable success, and it is time for the real show. Good evening, everyone. Uh, here in this hall tonight, cyber history is going to be made. Television had to get its start, radio had to get its start, and cybercasting will have its start tonight here in Urbana, Illinois. Mr. Arthur C. Clark. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Oh, I'm delighted to have a chance of talking to you from uh, Colombo. I'm delighted this has, has just seemed to be working. 
Right, well, if you are reasonable, you are not irrationally optimistic about the future, you have a chance of creating a self-fulfilling policy. The time is coming in the, in the early years of the next century uh, when, computer, when the internet operates at speeds greater than the speeds inside the human brain. However extraordinary computers may be, man is still the most extraordinary computer of all. I feel that uh, there's nothing special about humans. We're just the smartest thing that's ever happened. We're just at this point here uh, of having a brain this big and being just so smart. And uh, I think that, uh, that we're not in very good shape yet. Good afternoon, gentlemen. The reason to build intelligent machines is to take the good parts of ourselves and get them out of this body of limited capacity and get it into another framework where we can keep growing. We'll be starting to connect computers to our own brains. We'll start to merge ourselves with computers because we won't want to stay just people. I think it is indeed possible to download human beings into some kind of memory. And not only our bodies, but all our thoughts, emotions, everything. Maybe even the entire human race. In fact, I've seen some calculations that suggest that the whole human race could be put in a tiny capsule. And that's the way we'll go to the stars.